Welcome. I'm glad to see the auditorium filled because it's really a great, great pleasure to welcome Ana Pola Ruiz Galindo and Meki Roos from Pedro y Juana this evening, both as part of our lecture series, but also as a way to get a glimpse of what they are cooking in their advanced studio this semester, which we're delighted to have them teach. I should also note that it's really a privilege that they're here, given that they're presenting for the Ye Young Architecture Program competition uh, for MoMA PS1 on Friday. So really a big thank you, triple thank you for being here tonight. At a time when architecture, and by extension architects, uh, is more than ever urged to think and act across scales, to embrace systems thinking, to visualize and engage data and think relationally across contexts and cultures in an almost porous and disembodied way. It is both refreshing and empowering to consider Pedro y Juana's practice as operating around and through the primacy of the object. Through playfulness and reinvention, Ana Pola and Meki's work is reengaging in new ways the power of objects to affect their environment through what they have termed, quote, typological transgressions, as well as through their now well-established bold use of material, texture, color, placement, and form. Whereas space is of, often thought of as a means to stage relationship through architecture, it is instead around and through the object, its scale, its performance, its use and misuse that Pedro y Juana have approached architecture's capacity to assemble new and unexpected relationships with those that encounter them. Among some of their most well-known and inspiring projects are Sesiones Puerquito, or Little Pig, uh, where the act and performance of cooking a suckling pig becomes a pretext to design a gathering and invite new kinds of encounters and conversations. Archivo Pavilion, an intervention in the gardens of Archivo Diseño y Arquitectura in Mexico, where they designed a series of interconnected cone-shaped pots as one of their first public projects. Helmut, a table that is turned into a bench that turns into a table for Gallery One of Museo Humex in Mexico, Casa Reyes, an annex in an ex-colonial house in Merida, in Yucatan, and their breakup project at the first Chicago Architecture Biennale in 2015 with Love from the Tropics at the Randolph Square Living Room, an installation that was commissioned by our own Irene Chang as well as by Sarah Herda. The project was absolutely gorgeous and included custom furniture, lighting, wall hangings, and transformed the space uh, completely uh, 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 and entirely. More recently, they designed the Commons as part of the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, the renovation that is uh, currently underway by Johnston Mark Lee, with again an installation this time of hundreds of plants and light fixtures, as well as a series of fur modular furniture, uh, which transforms a space from cafe to concert venue to discussion space, uh, come placing education really uh, at the center, education and the community spaces at the center of the museum. Commenting on their Chicago Architecture Biennale installation for the Randolph Square <coughs> living room, Anna Pola and Meki once said that they are, quote, suspicious of big ideas. And yet it is evident from their work and the impact and resonance it is having in architecture as well as beyond, um, um, as well as beyond that their work, as well as their framing of their current studio, uh, shows how the clarity of their design investigations and their embrace of intersectionality has enabled them to frame both their research and their design process as going well beyond the objects themselves to uncover instead the larger processes that architectural elements are not only part of, but also can contribute to shaping in new ways. Please join me in welcoming Ana Pola Ruiz Galindo and Meki Roos from Pedro y Juana. Thank you so much, Anal, for having us here. It's really, it really is an honor to be here at GSAP, not only talking to you all today, but also teaching here. It's really, it's really great for us. I am Ana Paula, and this is Meki. Yes, our names are not Juana nor Pedro, but <laughs> Yes, we are Pedro y Juana. We needed a name that allowed us to be flexible with our practice and that did not respond either 
that not represented neither that represented neither of us. Our studio is collective, so is our work, and we were looking for a name that could allow us to grow wherever we wanted. We work across creative professions, not limited to one. Plus, we felt that architecture firms needed a bit of a twist with their naming. Enough partners with funky last names, enough, enough acronyms, just a common name that can grow or shrink, that can flow through disciplines, maybe also work as an alter ego. And we thought that it might not need explanation, but I guess it needs more explanation than we actually thought. We wanted our name to be one more actor that performs with our work, one that did not need to be defined by the discipline. If we wanted to cook, start a kindergarten or a dance company, Pedro y Juana might as well lend, it, lend itself to those. Anyways, Siegfried and Roy was already taken. And since we live and work in Mexico City, Pedro y Juana is much closer to home. So just as our name, our work also fluctuates. We constantly shift scales from furniture to building to objects and back again. History, myth, and the politics of objects is something that really interests us and we try to mix it with our work. We like to be informed by the context and pay special attention to the viewer, the body that, the body that will develop a relationship to whatever we create. Our purpose is for all these objects to create unexpected moments with those that encounter them. To be clear, all that we will show during this presentation is architecture. We're going to show you a series of projects that shift in range but somehow follow the same investigation. The word should speak for itself. We wanted to start off with a project that might help lay out the way we work. In 2015, we got invited uh, by the curators of the first Chicago Biennial to intervene in a public space inside of the Chicago Cultural Center, Randolph Square. We were interested in two particular things while developing the project. One of them represents the way we pretty much start every object, and that comes out of a clip of Stanley Kubrick's 2001 Space Odyssey. It shows the moment that the monkeys confront the monolith. It is the introduction of an object foreign to their natural inhabitant, an object without history, without meaning, that is only form, texture, and color. We're interested in the, inter in, in the, in the immediate relationship of both, the moment that they get to know each other and figure out a way to relate. And what happens after, once the body is separated from the object, how the object takes on cultural significance, how it translates, becomes part of our understanding, and changes once it turns into a utilitarian object. How time and place affect how we look at these objects. The second thing that we were curious, was curious to us was the fact that Randolph Square was inside the notion that the climate of Chicago Require something we understand is an old forward technology where had to move had to be moved inside or somewhat might move. But then all other Indian public technologies have described some sort of activity in the square. Everybody can do whatever the hell they please. Thinking about how public space or the plaza can live inside of the building, we looked at the other party says okay and it's not how. Where architecture and furniture provide a space to be and socialize, to reapply the idea of public interiors and object body relationships. Onto Randolph Square, inside the cultural center, a massive Bozar building, we decided to write a letter to Randolph. Dear Randolph, do you remember when the Chicago Cultural Center used to be the public library? Do you remember Randolph Square on the side of Randolph Street? the newspaper stands inside allowing Chicagoans to read the latest edition of the daily paper. Strange to call it a square, it being indoors. Anyways, Randolph Square used to be the place to go and get the latest news, or just to look at the pictures. Imagine the social encounters, political discussions, and mafia gossip that went on in and around that square. Then the books moved out of the building, and with them did the newsstands, the gossip and the political discussion. The nature and program of Randall Square started to change, as is the infrastructure of the aging building. Gas was switched off, and the sconces converted to electrical lighting. 
when the Tiffany Dome started to leaking, a state-of-the-art concrete shell was built over it. No more daylight, electricity did the job. Tiles started popping out of the floor, vinyl was discussed, but carpet won. Then came fluorescent lighting, maybe that was before the carpet, my memory is spotty, hence not necessarily truthful. The building was to be turned down, but since it was funded by a 1% tax levied on the population of Chicago, the people remember that it was actually theirs, and Randolph Square transformed into something else, allowing the people's palace to remain. Today, it is called the living room of the city. Imagine, the carpet came off and the tiles came back, and there the square stands, bare but for the marble clad walls and columns. Quite modern, but also quite Roman. Inside a building of Victorian excess, a bunch of unwily tables, some form a French bistro, some seemingly from the Middle Ages, populate the space. Not too, not too living room-like in the end, except for the gymna gymnastics classes on the first and third day of the month. The latest rumor changed again. Some architects are going to take out the fluorescent lighting in the ceiling coffers, replacing them with a web of thick string and suspended glass lead balls from back in the day. The system is shaped through a computer control array of push and pull, transforming light and shadow, promising a cessation of change throughout the day. The Roman marble walls will be dressed in Greek paint to reconnect with the original ceiling. The space will be unstable aiming to fulfill an ideal of domesticity in the public domain to rock on, to grant a degree of porch sitting autonomy, sofas to lie in, tables to stand at, slight typological transgressions that hint at something else. It will all add up to create a conversation between the body and the object or maybe just between the furniture and the Chicagoans that use it. Just truly, Pedro Juana. This is just the plate of clay. So I mean, whenever you put something that moves in a space, people can really go crazy. <laughs> At a certain point, we had to retain the weights because it was a bit too much play. So also, uh, as a postscript, we just wanted to show a bit of the testing, and pu the pushing and pulling that happens kind of behind the doors or throughout our process. We're constantly testing things in a mod dog first, obviously, <laughs> and then with actual, actually practice how far you could rock before you fell, taking into account all the people that were going to sit on these objects. It's safe. <laughs> Enough. Clay, as a child you get dragged through museums of badly lit harsh reflecting displays with little figures who got their heads chopped off or are missing a leg. Spoons next to broken cups, centuries old. Christian scripture claims that you are the descendant of a man whose wife was cut out of his torso in some areas of the world. He himself made out of clay. In Guatemala, early humans were not so lucky. Made from earth and mud, they soaked up water and dissolved after they are, they, after they are created from wood. But they did not have souls nor minds. They lose favor with the gods who caused them to be beaten and disfigured before receiving a deluge of heavy resin. First success of creation came out of maize dough, according to Popol Vuh. The pot is part of a proposal for a competition of a pavilion for Archivo, Diseño y Arquitectura in Mexico City that Pedro Juana won in 2012. What makes the pot such a peculiar object is the fact that by placing a plant into it, it becomes performative. We created one object for the design archive that, when proliferated, creates architecture. I'm waiting for it to proliferate in there. <laughs> Made out of clay. The object becomes an enclosed outside space that works as an amphitheater. 
the brick that becomes a wall, but then transforms through time. It grows up, amplifying the garden, and turns green, showing an ever-changing object. Clay has existed for centuries, and it is here to stay. We could even call it an emergent material, something that every civilization discovered on their own. And therefore, it has been the storyteller, witness, and evidence of many lives and households. It has been part of design since before design existed, and has always been part of Mexican life. We chose to use pots as an object of design to be recreated by us and as an architecture material to create a living pavilion that would grow and mold. And when the time comes to tear it down, you can just do it as they did in the old times, break it into little pieces back into the ground. In another approach to living creatures, With Love from the Tropics was a project that took place in Chicago. So this is then, in 1991, Clyde House, Joseph Paul Clyde's house, commis uh, gets commissioned to build a new home for the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. 20 somewhat years later, the Rationalist Square is in the need of an upgrade. So what we really like about this uh, plan is how it shows, I don't know who has been in Chicago, this is the lake and this is a public plaza in front. So actually the idea of Clyde House was to connect all these parks into the, towards the lake. So he was expecting people to kind of come through the museum and end up in the, in the lake in the back. So, but for, with the new um, remodel of the MCA, they decided to go not to expand, but just to renovate the, the interior of the museum by Uh, creating new program like the restaurant that you can go up until like two o'clock in the morning and this new area where we were commissioned to engage that was the commons. And the brief of the commons was the following. It was supposed to be a learning and educational space central to the museum that brings together artists, thinkers, and audiences through a constellation of artist projects, conversations, performances, interactions, workshops, presentations, and readings. The physical space will provide a forum to consider the fundamental social, political, and critical framework of art. This space will function as a gathering place for our community. So it wasn't short of ambition, but that was what we got. So, We decided to break it into programmatic requirements into five scenarios and approach this non-commercial third space through looking at leisure environments of artificial interior landscapes. And also looking at its opponent, like the jungle, a place where something is always about to happen. But there is obviously a problem with that whole story if you move it into the context of, of Chicago, where the MC8 sits, which is the climate of the Midwest. They were recently like minus 20 something degrees Celsius. <laughs> Nevertheless, there is also an architectural solution to that problem. The conservatory, which if you look at it from a programmatic standpoint, is a nice analog, as it is a site for experimentation, crossbreeding, and pollination. A laboratory that allows for new possibilities that would be geographically unavailable otherwise if it wasn't to a relatively simple architecture intervention <laughs> made possible by glass. So, tropical winter. Bring some warmth and sentiment into the commons. Introduce the ambience of the jungle. Not being able to engage any of the floor surface uh, of the newly opened space for the commons we decided to go into the ceiling and suspend an artificial foliage. By opening it up and adding an artificial light, we created an individual autonomous conservatory in itself, which is capable of supporting the plants throughout the dark days of the year, which looks something like this for a museum with a collection and an archive. There's only one issue with our proposal, the four major pests. Spider mite, mealy bug, scale, fungus net. After some silence conversing with the plant professionals and consulting an entomologist, it turned out that by trimming down our plant list, there are no dangers to preservation. In addition to cover the ambitious brief, we needed to add certain elements to the ground. A table that folds to a bench that folds flat, a daybed 
that allows for the commons to turn into sanatorium where clean air and the landscape is consumed from a state of, semi, of the semi-horizontal. Two-seater and one-seater, which make up different configurations of people sharing a moment or not. These are Anastasia Brunhilde and Olivia in their first iteration of prototypes where we tested them in cardboard stock color and uh, their lighting abilities. The second iteration at the museum itself with the curators looking uh, at, them at them in the ceiling as a pair of two. Uh, a third test where we actually added plants, then lights, and this is the final result. If we're coming in through uh, the renovation that just <laughs> Mark Lee did, coming in, going up, you start looking like seeing bits of, of, of the ceiling. When you step up, you can see this upside down garden on top of you. And yeah, oh, this is a close up view. And finally, the, these things at the end actually open up as a Murphy bed for a stage to be put on. And all of the furniture can be, well, there you have the table as a table and as a bench, and then if it gets folded, it can actually go behind into the hooks in the back. And it's always also great to just see it, to kind of live its life in the social media and to actually see that it is being used in all of its forms for presentations, talks, and performances that take place at the MCA. So now we're gonna show you um, lost competition for uh, the um, Venice Biennial in the one that Rem Cook has curated. This was in collaboration with Jimena Hogreve and Montserrat Alvarez Gleason. And it plays, and it will end up in a, actually becoming a project, but it sort of plays with the idea of history and how we read it. So in the brief for 2014, Cujas talks about modernity as a loss of identity. The image comes from the presentation that he sent, this image comes from the presentation he sent out to the participants or those that were competing for the pavilion. The idea for the National Pavilions of the Baena was to assemble a survey of 100 years of modernity throughout the world. The following is our proposal as a possible perspective on a Mexican modernity. In 1969, the artist Robert Smithson, Nancy Holtz, and the gallerist Virginia Duan went to a trip to the southeast of Mexico. They went to Chiapas, Campeche, Tabasco, and Yucatan. During their stay in Palenque, they slept in Hotel Palenque, founded in 1937. Three years later, in 1972, Smithson gave a talk known to us now as Hotel Palenque to students of architecture in the University of Utah whom were waiting to be lectured about Palenque's archaeological site and got instead an architectural and archaeological analysis of the hotel Smithson stayed at. Through a slideshow presentation, sorry, sorry. the hotel was going through a remodel during the visit. Buildings that were being partly rebuilt coexisted with those that were being constructed. It was a test of try and error in which the edification, new and old, they seemed to intertwine with each other and lose each other out and cancel each other, generating a state where the architectural exercise was expanded in time. Smithson passed entire afternoons meditating this perpetual transition, one he denominated de-architecturization and was sure that will give a result of, un, of an undifferentiated structure without a center. Through a slideshow presentation, Smithson constructed an absent revision of the Palenque ruins, the temples, the Mayan observatories, and other wonders that were pre, that this pre-Spanish Indians built. So he said. He unveiled at the time cultural practices of Mexico, such as the milpa, a constructive Mayan spirit that was still active, and a Mexican temperament. By making a detailed revision of the building, he invented a modern narrative that was not pointing to the West as origin an ubiquitous modernity already invented in Hotel Palenque and reinterpreted in the pre-Hispanic pyramids. 
The constructive method, as much as the structure he describes, can am be amplified till the point of proposing not only a reading of the building, but also a reading of modernity. Pabellón Mexico, then, becomes a system that, through its various actors, described further ahead, proposes modernity as an operation and, a loc and localizes the problem of architecture as a strategy. In Pabellón Mexico, the notions of fundamentals and absorption of modernity set by the architecture biennial are inverted and find multiple points of departure. In the following, both Smithson text and our words are interwined. The pavilion begins in the tropical jungle. It starts with the pyramid and continues with its rereading. It is an exercise to narrate a modernity that disseminates the center and ventures to take as a possible model the pre-Hispanic architecture. It is there where modernity reinvents itself and where the system of hierarchies set by the West are destabilized. A modernity that weaves itself like a serpent, that piles and waits, that makes visible time in architecture, that gets constructed through facades within facades, overlapping facades, facades on facades. A modernity that in this way from the future to the past breaks the historical linearity and generates a pause in which things are almost always about to happen. One in which things are always almost about to happen. Pabellón Mexico uses Hotel Palenque as a strategy for how to talk about modernity, as a structure without a center that displaces the origin and that complicates the way in which it is absorbed. Just like a Douglas Graphs diagrams, looking for par parallels where time collapses and is no longer read in a linear way, understanding both time and history in constant movement. So, this is the Mayan arch. The pavilion allows to present Mexico and the pre-Columbian architecture as the starting point. The pavilion as an inverted replica of Smithson's system. To talk about pre-Hispanic architecture as an instrument for modern thought. This system is put in operation through the interaction of four elements. Architectural intervention, a cantina program, a diaporama, and a printed guide. The architectural intervention generates a gridded forest, a structure without a center that replicates the intertwining snaking way from one side to the other and back again, back and forth to and fro. It's made up by a series of columns that reinterpret the Mayan arch. Columns in front of columns, on top of columns, to construct a grid where the supports multiply and expand. The void in between the columns create a gridded ceiling over the tables where the diaporama is projected. Element two, the cantina, is a site of the long Mexican afternoon and the place from where modernity can be thought and activated. It is a cantina, which is practically a pub, that offers a pause, a breathing space to think about the themes put forward by the Baniel. It is the export to Venice of a Mexican space that allows for unique and specific socializing methodology. In Utah, Smithson worked as a tourist guide of a site without a site. The same takes place in the diaporama. The guide encounters itself with the problem of talking about architecture without the site. The diaporama makes a revision of modernity through images of pre-Hispanic architecture, allowing the visitor to construct his own stories, connecting what they find here with their own experience. And so here comes the test of what you would have experienced while sitting in the cantina of the pavilion while sipping mezcal. We have arrived at the Templo de la Cruz Foliada, Temple of the Foliated Cross. You can see it on our left. Obviously, it gets some type of maintenance to be able to differentiate itself from nature. The, ceros, the force of the jungle in Palenque seems to have the same force as the growth of the gods that are venerated there. Nature and edifice are interlaced in such a way that at any moment it is going to be impossible to distinguish one from the other. That is because nature is indifferent. It does not recognize edifices nor gods. The Fransworth House goes through the same struggle when the Fox River emerges. It would seem that architecture exists despite the nature. It is 
and in position. It fights gravity. It rises as close as it can to the sky, and it encounters itself on a perpetual struggle. We could think about architecture as, the, as that which is always occurring against the devastating force that is instinctively trying to blend and de-differentiate itself from it. Here we see Teotihuacan. The abstraction of the site makes one think about the rational forms of modernity. The way the volumes are placed reminds us, reminds us of Ciudad Universitaria or Illinois Institute of Technology, even Brasilia. It makes one remember urban utopian intents driven by grids and sectors. Here too appears the linear axis of composition. The one that connects everything is called the Calzada de los Muertos, the road of the dead. Look at the lack of symmetry before an axis this potent. It seems to be a parallel gesture to the intent of the European avant-garde to disappear at the center. If you look closely, the monumentality of the void impresses more and suggests that is what defines it all. It is within this, that void that we all move. That's where you encounter the architectural promenade. With the notion of relativity of time appeared the idea of the fluid and, the, and dynamic space, an idea that materializes through industrial elements. This image obliges us to think of buildings that rise from the ground like the prisons that prostrate themselves in the highest point, forcing our gaze upwards, just like a, sky a skyscraper. It is a monument to progress in a moment where the city is screaming for more housing. These buildings will house thousands, will house thousands. At the bottom left, where the columns cluster together, we can see the end of the super block of the Centro Urbano Presidente Alemán. The social spaces start there in the stacking of the rocks in the first plane, and they continue till you get to the educational centers. Imagine the concrete blocks zigzagging, diagonally like a serpent through the site. The blocks elevated by pilotes start creating plazas for distinct activities. In one of them, if it wasn't for the strong sun and disuse, you could almost see the pool, close, close due to the security reasons and the loss of community. So, so Hotel Palenque is not in Yucatan, it's the follow-up of this lost competition uh, where Montserrat Albordes Gleason invited us uh, to participate in her exhibition that she was curating at the CCS in upstate New York. And uh, we followed up on uh, the themes of the pavilion in order to uh, come up with a project for her. So we are back to the Mayan arch that we this broke up in two parts, one the column and one the drawing of the column, but in a three-dimensional space, uh, solid and wireframe, that we were going to place inside of the exhibition. Here the pavilion replaces the restaurant of Hotel Palenque where Smithson used to spend hours at, generating a space, a space where you can spend hours having a discussion. We were proposing a non-hierarchical exchange, one without a center, to let knowledge and information presented and exchanged during the symposium that was held during the exhibition by the curators of the world. Uh, <laughs> to find its own form. The rotated and tilted grid encounters and ignores the existing structure of the museum. A structure without a center that is made of assemblies of columns that in Paris create the Mayan arch in which you can find a table that replicates the serpent's trail that circulates from one side to the other and back again, in which hierarchies are de-differentiated. And this is how we actually made it. So this is a... Uh, <laughs> place we are tearing down and rebuilding in Mexico City currently, where we uh, made the first prototypes of these columns. There was very little budget, so uh, the drawings of the columns were actually made out of yarn, and the solids themselves out of cardboard, and these are early tests of how to get out of a typical sheet of plywood, uh, cardboard, <laughs> uh, a, a proper column built together. We tried horizontal ways of assembling them and then vertical ones. They had to be shift, shift, 
we had to send them to New York. So they also had to be flattened. Well, that so was part of the budget at the end of the day because uh, it's really hard to, to get uh, s about 100 colum columns built in New York for the price that we had. So we made it in Mexico, uh, cut them there, and then uh, painted them in dye okay. and brought them over to, to the CCS. So this is just for scale, so you can see the size of these columns. And this is uh, in the CCA, so one can't figure out why they put that there, but it seems to belong. It seems to have some incredible sort of Mayan necessity. It is just grew up sort of like the tropical growth, a sort of Mexican geologic man-made wonder. And this is what you encounter when you were coming in to the middle of the exhibition after and this is where the symposium took place. We were really trying to shift the idea of a hierarchy of not having uh, the presenters in one side. And so we put screens also all over the, the room and also behind in the other side of, of the wall in this idea of, the, of, not, of not paying attention to the existing structure. But the curators still wanted a hierarchy and they sat in the front. And so it was really hard to make them shift. So, shift again. A house in the outskirts of Mexico City. Our client uh, bought a house at a very low price in the suburbs of Mexico City in a gated community and wanted to flip it. These, uh, the prices uh, around this area were going up and she found this house in, well, not horrible conditions, but the house itself was pretty strange. And so our main problem was on how to make something subtle so that it could be sold. So it didn't have to be, uh, well, we tried not to make it too, too much, and, but we wanted to work with very simple materials. And throughout, the house, you can see these shifts also in, in scales throughout the patterns and the materials that, that we use. So mo what we were more interested in is to design the kind of thinking of the way that you move through this house. And we also wanted to show you a bit of the back and forward when you're like designing and this is the celosia or the facade in the front. We made it out of just this uh, brick that is produced in Puebla, in Mexico, that is a bit wider than just regular uh, brick. And these were the templates that we had to give the constructor in order to... So this to is a little bit the digital f production that happens in the computer with uh, the tools that we have available today. And then a simple output that uh, anybody that is actually a mason can use on site in order to produce uh, something a little bit more complicated. Uh, no machinery necessary to use. I mean, this is also pretty straightforward gesture. A little screen that uh, yeah passes in 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 front of the street and kind of uh, separates uh, the the terrace that is on the first floor from the rest of the street. So coming in, passing that first. Uh, border that was kind of on top of you. You entered the first patio that has the radial uh, detail on the floor also by just uh, using river rocks that we created around the column and that kind of moved you into the house. So this is what it kind of looked like before. It was constructed by a doctor apparently, and but the structure was pretty sturdy. So we decided to keep the structure and it, it concentrate on that <laughs> and punch a call in the middle of the house to allow the light to kind of circulate into the, into the building and uh, create this threshold between the inside and the outside. So this would be the second patio or garden, interior garden that you will encounter in the house. And we kept the original structure that actually helped us kind of organize the different programs in the house and we just kind of pushed out to con connect with the outside garden. So this is a view of the garden from 
the first terrace. And here you can see a bit of that movement that we really wanted, we were very interested in, well, maintaining. So you go in, you go down to the garden and you can come back up inside and it's kind of a continuous um, walk. So this is going back in towards the facade in the back. And we were very worried about putting uh, plants in the presentation, but it's just to show a bit of how the inside and the outside communicate with each other and go up and back and in and out. And this is how it looked before, or this is what we were faced with. And well, this was the result. All of the materials are local materials. This is a, a volcanic rock that we just cut to kind of resemble the interior wooden floor. And we brought that to the outside. Oh, and we were very interested in having a type of fossy facade or like try, trying a new treatment. You can't quite see it that well over there. But this was also made of a pigmented color and then just little rocks that were put up into the wall with a broom. So it was a constant, it was more about just finding these, uh, well, local materials and trying to create a different kinds of textures. Casa Reyes uh, is our first project probably that we did uh, when we were still in Merida. The Reyes family had invited Jorge Pardo, who we were working with at the time, to remodel a colonial house in the center of Merida. And we were finishing up a project uh, of Jorge in the Yucatan and about to fly the coop to Mexico City to start our own thing, but then got generously invited to do the annex for this project and execute Jorge's project for the rest of the house. Uh, this is a very deep lot in the center of Merida, typical colonial uh, typology of, of courtyard structures. And in the back, you see perpendicular a bar that is the annex. So we, we serially repeated uh, the, the courtyard gesture uh, and created another one in order to then go through and get into the garden. Uh, with a lot of color, the, these are, this is a drawing of the, of the tiled floors and uh, the tiled pool. And uh, the same in reverse reflecting on the ceilings. Uh, and the thing was, again, how to get out of a relatively cheap construction material uh, a screen that, that, that would be a diaphanous gesture to let the garden and patio in and at the same time uh, have the possibility of an indoor climate. So we just flipped the cinder block around, uh, closed a couple of holes, uh, made a little production site on site, filled these three randomly uh, filled blocks on mass and then put them onto the facade. Well, there was actually a system because you could only have like a, a certain variety. So we put them together. Uh, we did give them a drawing that they were supposed to follow in order to, to get the facade to what it was. But it was a nice uh, result and one that we got a lot more, um, well, we, we were allowed to do more with what we, with what we had. We were not going to sell this house at the end and the clients were very generous and obviously loved colors, so this was the final resort, the result. And it also connected kind of directly with the pool, so from your bed, you can just wake up in the morning and jump into the pool. Thank you. I'm uh, really happy to be here with you guys tonight. Um, we have uh, know each other for we had knew each other Since for a long time. Chicago Since the first Chicago Biennial. Uh, so it's a, really a pleasure to, to be with you. Also, I think that there's kind of a parallel between your office and my office because we started at the same moment. We kind of grew together somehow in the same context. Um, but uh, let me go backwards a bit uh, and uh, try to gossip a bit about your background and uh, link it a bit with uh, what you explained tonight because it's something that you haven't mentioned. So you both studied 
in different schools, in the Metamecan in Ghana, in your case, Ana Paula, in your case, first in Delft, uh, Mekki, and uh, suddenly you met here in the US, uh, in Los Angeles, at, uh, studying at SciArc. And somehow, after, after those years, you started um, working for an artist, right? And you lightly um, mentioned it, uh, your relation with Jorge Pardo at the beginning. And I think that that collaboration and the fact that you start uh, um, practicing as, as, you know, working for an artist really influenced your practice after that. Not only because after those six years working for Jorge Pardo allowed you to start a practice together, but definitely somehow uh, there's a clear influence of uh, the art world with your own architectural practice. So the fact that, for instance, you always blur, you always try to blur the relation between the object not only, to, let's name it object, not uh, product of design, but object with art, with architecture at large, it's quite particular in your work. Are you? Are we conscious of it? Are you <laughs> conscious of that? Uh, yes, for sure, we, we, say we, met, uh, we met at SciArc. Uh, we, we, I was doing there my master's and Mickey was there as an exchange student. And uh, Mickey started working for Jorge Pardo before I actually finished school, and I was really taken by what he was doing, <laughs> so I kind of pushed myself into the Jorge Pardo practice, no? <laughs> A little bit, I think. I think we and just don't know any different to do because we have no formation in a proper architecture office. So our, our, our professional career uh, <clears throat> Under, under the guise of somebody else, sort of an apprenticeship that we probably took on in, in those six years that we were working with him, uh, that the, the practice was very much uh, based in the making of things and, and thinking kind of conceptually about uh, what you were making from the very beginning until you made it and it transformed into something else. And so, uh, to, to give a little bit of context, this was a studio environment with a big workshop. So the things happened in the computer and then got executed in the shop by all of us that were involved. And so I, I think um, that and then sort of being on the sideline of the art world uh, when, when, we, when we started to come up with Pedro y Juana and engage with uh, the world of architecture as we understood it coming from that uh, world, that, that, that what you saw is to a certain degree the response of, of that. But we're half conscious about it. <laughs> and for me what is also really interesting is that you use the idea of a narrative always behind your project. So there's a story always embedded in anything that you do and thanks to the use of that narration, you're actually able to blur the limits between the object, the art piece, and the architecture. So you're always linking the object with the user, with the, with the enclosure, and beyond that. Yes, I think we, we like to tell stories uh, through the objects that we create. So it is, I mean, even if some of this um, storytelling happens, like, I, I guess it's, yeah, I, I, the narrative even is kind of part of our process of working because always when you're designing, I think we have to often think about like it's either history of the context or the object, the history of the object. Something has to give you a certain amount of guidelines to how to start approaching something. So uh, I guess that's where the narrative comes in. And yeah, I we, think we, we like storytelling too. Well, we, 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 I think we're also looking for formats to try to describe architecture that, that, that kind of uh, give credit to what these things actually are. So we, we, are, we are not in the position to be critical, uh, critically looking at a project we're developing at the time and try to come up with a project description so we end up using a letter as a format to describe uh, what the hell we are doing and, and how, how to approach a process of design. Um, so it, these, these, whether it's a letter, a recipe, 
for cooking or a, a um, sort of a manual for packing something. These, these, these become uh, tools that enter the design process. Uh, so Somehow it's also um, something that maybe it's quite particular of the format itself. The fact that you work a lot in frame line installations or, you know, uh, like uh, interior, uh, for instance, the one at the MCA in Chicago, interior designs, allow you to jump really fast from the concept to the materialization. And that allows somehow to keep the strength of the concept that is behind it. So how much is that actually a, a fact in architecture? Can we uh, affirm that, or totally is a stupid thing to, <laughs> to affirm that somehow these kind of practices allow uh, the concept to emerge more easily, or the narration to emerge more easily? I don't know. I mean, at the, at the end of our presentation, we tried to uh, portray some of our more architectural pr projects, let's say. And I think, of course, it's there. I think we are also trying to step away from explaining kind of the process of our architecture in order to give it more of a conceptual or a narrative or a storytelling, a, a way of telling that story that doesn't necessarily need to explain like the day-to-day -day or like the technical parts we kind of jump uh, back from that. But I think, yes, I think of course it's possible because the concept doesn't only lie within an idea. And that's what, I mean, we, had, we, we did say that, that we were afraid of like big ideas because we do believe that the material itself can show you, like can tell the story itself. Like it's not, uh, it's not necessary, like the concept doesn't need to, it doesn't like you just have a concept and then you develop something. Our, like the concept is throughout all those stages. So at the end, the result is part of the, like the, the things that change within that moment of idea and design, that middle part is what we're interested in. Or I, that's, the middle part is where the concept develops. For but us, I also think I they're think. two different animals to a certain degree. It's like, they're, sure, there's buildings. Buildings are highly utilitarian, as is a chair or a table. Mm -hmm. um, so then obviously comes in the client that asks something from you. So within the context of a museum and installation, the, the liberty you have to, to develop, uh, I wouldn't say really an idea. It's, it, these, are, these are kind of motions that put something in, into, into movement and, and become something in the case of the MCA. Um, where we basically just flipped uh, a garden around, or well, the house that we showed. It's, it's, in it sounds like easy. We just flipped like a garden around, but also it was a it was a discussion with the museum mm -hmm. too. It was not something that they were completely pleased about at the first mm -hmm. uh, sight of like plants within yeah. the museum. So it's a negotiation. <laughs> no, I, I I do totally agree. I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't say that it's thanks to client. It's clearly your way of understanding the practice. Yeah. And I'm saying this because, for instance, one of the facts that is happening in the last decades that is quite controversial is the commodification of pavilions. Mm -hmm. Like pavilions and ephemeral installations until recently mm -hmm. were the place where the discipline could, could be pushed further. So places were to test things, to talk about things that were not able to be discussed in other formats in architecture. And during this last decade, suddenly the pavilions have became, you know, they, they turn into something that uh, could be sold, and therefore <coughs> they became products. They became, you know, objects of the system, products of the, of the market. And uh, somehow I think that uh, through the fact that uh, you use narration and stories embedded in your designs, you're able to go beyond the physical, but uh, as well, you're able to escape that commodification and fight it back somehow. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, obviously the story can last longer than the 
maybe the commodification of the object. But I mean, I wonder, is it wrong to, to, to become a, an object that gets commodified? In, are we, like, what do you mean by that? <laughs> Why are you kind of resisting the fact that maybe pavilions are bought because it might not be so bad for architects at the end of the day? <laughs> I mean, we need to make money somehow, right? <laughs> Not well, maybe up. maybe with this controversy, it's a good moment to open uh, <laughs> the discussion to the public and uh, allow uh, more questions. Did the Archivo, um, you know, project? It did travel in some way. No, has that? Has that appeared in other forms in other places besides, you know, friends' houses? Well, this project actually got donated to a public space yeah. and it got destroyed. <laughs> By the people who were using it or what do you mean? No, yeah, well, people, some, some stole some of the pots and some got broken and it... It's actually still there. It, is, it, yeah, is, it, is it sits in the though. front of the, the, the city hall a city hall, there are a lot of city halls in, throughout Mexico City, and uh, people live in there temporarily, just like put, put, put tarps over it, and uh, the plants pretty much have been ripped out. So it, it obviously cannot exist as, as this thing that you saw curated nicely put into the garden of an ex Baragan garden. Um, when but it, it does have an afterlife, and I kind maybe, of appreciate that. Yeah, well, maybe that's in the next version of the presentation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Mickey was too afraid of taking the pictures at that moment. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's reasonable. My camera would have been gone. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting to see these projects and, and uh, have them uh, described by you and... Um, I, I thought it was uh, um, uh, fascinating to, fall, to observe the relationships in the thinking behind those projects. Um, one question I want to ask is, uh, how do you think the, the presence of the object that seemed to formulate so much the first uh, part of, of the pr presentation you made, so the installations which were made by objects often re repetitive or you know, placed, placed in a context in an environment, in a building, in a lobby, whatever uh, the case uh, was. Uh, how, how do you feel that this happens when, we, when, uh, when there's a more conventional architectural project like a house, like the two examples you showed in the end? Because I'm, real, I'm, tr I'm trying to r realize uh, wh what for me was a big difference, and I'm realizing now that uh, I think the, the photographs of the apartments that you saw were even empty of objects. They were kind of empty spaces. So I want to I wanna hear how you feel these two uh, different types of projects. Like, do you feel them as very different or? Well, I think that, the, yeah, well, they're different uh, in, in the fact that you do have a client, that you have somebody that tells you like what you can sometimes do. But I feel the transgressions are maybe a little uh, less apparent, maybe more gesture-like. For example, that uh, I mean, we wanted to talk a lot about these patios that you encounter while you walk through the house, and that I think is important. Even if you push back at the facade or you're crossing like a boundary that is at another level, and then you have a garden inside the house that kind of talks to that other garden behind it. So I think this also becomes something about living or being inside a space and how you walk kind of through it. And maybe then, I mean, it also gets another life because when it gets filled or when it gets bought, which that house did, and I heard that it completely changed. They changed all the woods and put marble in it and they took away the garden, the first interior patio. So, I mean, it completely now I want to see that afterlife. Maybe that's also something to do. <laughs> I think as architects, you can sort of uh, induce gestures to happen around uh, the way you structure your environments. Whether that is a table, you know, it's like that you decide to put uh, us in front of the auditorium and structure the hierarchies as us presenting to you 
you asking us questions or us sitting around a round table and drinking beer and having that same conversation, completely different scenario. And I think at the end of the day, if you replicate that and, and use the tools that you have available when building spaces, uh, <clears throat> somebody who deals with kitchens a lot probably can tell you uh, how the fact that the kitchen moves at a certain point in history into the house affects the way we live together. Or how the bathroom or the toilet that moves into the house and relates to our body to a certain degree uh, dictates how our own relationship to the body is structured. So I think um, you're completely right that the pictures are lacking stuff, but then you have these architectural photographers that take pictures without stuff. <laughs> and then you come later and try to talk to the people that move in. Hey, can I come in and take a picture? I'm like, nah. <laughs> but there's a, it's a, I, I think that there's a link actually um, across your process. And uh, maybe it's not that clear, but the, the idea of craftsmanship is, is always there. Even you know in in the last bra in the houses that you have uh, shown, especially in the first one, actually your first project mm -hmm. in the in the in the little uh, room, the real extension of the house, and uh, and for me it's something that of course I'm I'm extremely jealous because we don't we don't have that high that level of crime machine in Spain anymore. We have lost it in the last um, the last decade, and it's something that I always envy about uh, the Mexico production. And, uh, and, and it's actually a, a nice uh, a scenario that you're operating in, right? Because uh, you have these local craft machines that have the, the, there's a, a high value on that. But uh, you're also operating in an international level, right? Mm -hmm. And somehow it's, it's quite a privileged scenario that uh, we should all be aware of. But it's also a double coin of the, of the a double side of, we have a double side of the coin because you can do it because of a certain, uh, you know, a circumstance of economy. Mm -hmm. We might get hired for that reason outside the country. <laughs> and I'm, I'm being controversial here now. And, uh, but I think that we should talk about it and we should be aware because of, for instance, the project in, that you produced in New York, you were actually being, and I, 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 I was really happy to listen in, in, during the conference the lecture that you were actually being quite sincere. Okay, we, we have to produce it in Mexico, otherwise we couldn't uh, produce that. And uh, somehow, how, so the question is not to be critical with that, but actually to be aware and to know how to, to move forward without losing the quality of the craft machine how to be able to keep on operating in an international level, keeping the local craftsmanship, but at the same time, uh, rising uh, the economy of Mexico. Well, what's interesting about Mexico, on the sideline of that a little bit, is that uh, you, you're dealing with a country that, that operates on this very crafty level due to, to, to mm -hmm. the status of its economy, but then at the same time, is having an output of uh, high-end industries, industries of, of car manufacture, of aeronautical manufacture, of high-precision manufacture. So it gives us access to these both worlds that exist at the same time. And mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it is a great playground in a way. You, you, the, the second thing about it is that we come from a world where we design, manufactured, in a way, the stuff. And uh, then when you get a project somewhere else and you have actually access over it and you can go see the <laughs> sites where, where things are being produced, you, you can take that into your um, design methodology to a certain degree. So that is the great benefit on the other side. What were you going to say? <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> <laughs> no, of course. I mean, we're very conscious of the uh, of what we we're in Mexico, and we're like there's a saying in Mexico, so far away from God and so close to the USA, right? So I mean, it, it has completely uh, 
like ship like being so close to the U.S. Also, I think I mean we are an example of this kind of relationship between <coughs> Mexico and the U.S. NAFTA right now. Everything that is happening with Trump, etc., is is well, is close to home, and we understand the politics, and we like to read the politics through objects as well, right? We constantly say, I mean, it it gives you a bit of information of well the conditions that are happening in a place. We actually work within all types of materials. We like to, I mean. We work with uh, craftsmen people, like the ones that made the the pots, and we continuously buy from them. And we have like a very close relationship with the people that produce uh, everything that we do. Even with the fabricators that did the MCA, which was also produced in Mexico, and and we send it over to 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 Chicago. That was also like a crazy endeavor. We now know all the loopholes that you need to cross bureaucratic things and we know how much like a, we have been stopped in the airport for hours because we have tables in, with us in the plane. So we, we understand those politics and we believe also that I mean I think that the objects that you create are the ones that have to do the politics for you. I mean in that mm -hmm. sense we are not uh, politicians right? <laughs> so yeah. we're hoping to, that throughout whatever we create maybe there's something that informs that part of the process. No, definitely, probably it's a, it's a matter of raising value. Like mm -hmm. in Spain, craftsmanship has been lost, not because a lack of economy, t totally the opposite. It was lost mainly during our construction boom. And it was lost because there was a loss of value towards that. And that's a, you know, it was a huge disaster. Right. Um, more questions? Hi. Um, I'm just trying to come to terms with what I saw today, and it's my first time seeing the presentation. And I think, I don't know, uh, from where I sit, it's sort of a, a, there's like a masterful subtlety of what we saw today in terms of a continuity of wanting to work within the constraints. And, and I really appreciate it. It's more of a comment, not a question. I'll make it short. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the fact that there was a video shown of people using spaces, of testing ideas, the prototypes for the chair, the silhouette for the column, the packaging, etc., through to the house, the construction. And it's unusual for a young office to want to show that part of what they're doing and uh, present it as part of the story and the concept. And uh, you know, it's 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 the it's the beginning of something that you've started, and uh, I think the future uh, looks promising from my seat. So, th just uh, sort of thank you for sharing that. It's 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 something that should be recognized because it's atypical uh, in most schools of architecture when when you see these presentations. Thanks, Jake. <laughs> I I was very happy to. To see this dimension, this craftsmanship dimension, and and also showed Lina Bobardi <laughs> in the beginning of the presentation. And Lina was, I mean, Lina in the context of modernity in Brazil, she had an Italian background, and she completely, she entirely reformulated her way to engage with modernity by looking at Brazilian craftsmanship. So, I mean, that that's what what makes her work so singular. And, and what I think is great, and, and hearing that you also had a background working with an, art, an artist, and, and the way that this probably influenced you in how you experiment with materials, you experiment with techniques, I, it, makes a, it makes a lot of sense for me when, uh, after this was uh, explained. And, and what I think is great about that is that it's, it's not only about, let's say it's about memory, because you are looking, you are looking at CNC, but you are also looking at ancient techniques of brick making or, or whatever. So it's 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 really about memory. It's about engaging with technology because each new material that you work with, you you have to to again to understand the constraints, to understand the possibilities, and it's about development. Because when you engage with a material which is ordinary and like a pot or or those, those perforated bricks, and, and you start to give them a, a new perspective, you are, also trying, you are also helping to bring these things further. So if we think of these ancient techniques, 
if we think of this, let's say, this, this uh, social structures that, that, that are uh, related to the fabrication of those goods, etc., you are helping to push these things forward. You are helping to, to give new perspectives, to helping to, to find new ways to use these things. So I really, it's also a comment, and I really enjoyed <laughs> to see your lecture. Thank you. I mean, in, the, in regard to the craft part, of course, we, I mean, we constantly like to travel in Mexico because it's also a vast territory mm -hmm. with millions of different ways of producing stuff. But it's also, it takes a lot of effort to do this craft, like the way that they used to do it. So it also has to kind of change and get integrated to like the, a marketable, mm -hmm. well, not, a mar not to market it, but to understand that the times are also a uh, constraint for this uh, type of, uh, Things. And it's still cheap to produce in, in Mexico, and that has also to change because it's a, a lot of hard work <laughs> going into different types but of But I crafts. think it's, it's definitely a good um, question that not only you, but all uh, kind of these uh, this new international practices that we're uh, you know, kind of living in and, uh, and uh, dealing with, uh, we should all be aware of. Yeah. We're big fans of Lina, so <laughs> of course we know that she was involved in the club. Okay, I think that with those two last comments that were really nice, it, uh, maybe we can close up the session. Thank you very much.